Welcome, everybody. We are a little after 2 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started and let anyone who straggles in come in a little bit later. Um, my name's Nathan George. I'm the CTO for the Sovereign Foundation. I work for a nonprofit um, that is building a public network to do identity. Um, our tagline at the Sovereign Foundation is identity for all. So we're very serious about making an identity work network that works for everyone all over the world for anything that you want to use it for. Um, we are not a for-profit organization. We are run by volunteers. Um, so I will give my PBS style pitch that I am here because folks have been generous to donate money to the Sovereign Foundation. That's why I'm able to do what I do and that's why I'm able to uh, work on this open source code and help a lot of you who are in the audience coordinate on the things that need to happen next. So thank you to those organizations that are helping to support us um, and making this stuff happen. Um, a little bit of perspective about how I'm approaching this idea of standards and interoperability is probably in order. Um, the Sovereign Foundation it, it runs a public network that spans the globe. We have 82 stewards, which are co mostly companies that you will have heard about, um, especially if you've been participating here at Hyperledger. Some of them are companies that you may not have heard about because they're smaller or organizations. Um, the idea here is that there's a lot of diversity in the network. We want public companies, private companies, large companies, small companies, companies from all around the globe doing all sorts of different things running nodes so the network stays fair, stays safe, and continues to do what you expect it to do. Um, there's about 270, well, I think we're up to about 282 code developers in GitHub now across all the repositories that go into building the Sovereign Network. Um, primarily, our code is hosted in Hyperledger Ares, Hyperledger Indy, and Hyperledger Ursa. Those code bases are the edge peer-to-peer -peer protocol with Ares uh, that does wallet and signing transaction type things. Um, with Ursa, it's a shared cryptography library that it can be used by any of your blockchain solutions. And then, obviously, India is the core blockchain that we, those stewards are running to, to build those nodes to have a public instance of an identity ledger. There's, in addition to that, a whole lot of volunteers working on what we call the governance framework, which are the business and the legal rules that make all that stuff work. Um, I see some really good contributors to that group here in the audience. Um, so later, I'll probably ask any of you who are code contributors or governance framework participants to raise your hands. That way, people can pick on you after my presentation is done, and you can tell them why I'm wrong. Um, and then, of course, we have a small staff at the Sovereign Foundation, and our job is to help um, facilitate companies working together. Um, I think there's, last count, I think there's 12 companies that have commercial solutions that you can just go buy on top of the Sovereign ecosystem, and there's a whole bunch of others that offer consulting services and other things that you can do to make this identity platform stuff work for you. Um, and I see a lot of those guys in the audience as well. So um, the, the staff helps facilitate that and make it so that the companies with different goals can continue to work together and do the things that they need to do to get what they want. Um, there's a map of where the nodes are for the Sovereign Network. Um, they're everywhere. We have at least two contributors from every continent except for Antarctica, where the two contributors are not from the same company. I, I'm really, really proud when we were able to pass that mark. I, I thought that was really important. Um, and uh, everyone has different interests in the network. They come from different industries. They have different ideas about what they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to do. And I'm hoping that as we talk about standards and interoperability, I can convince you of a few uh, important things. Um, usually when we talk about identity stacks at the Sovereign Foundation, we usually put this picture up, and we'd spend a lot of time talking about what. But we don't spend as much time talking about why from a technical standpoint. As Scott knows, we talk a lot about why from a philosophical standpoint, but why from a technical standpoint is also important, and I think it will help you understand why we approached the problem the way they did, and maybe hope, hopefully it will help you understand why identity is hard in most blockchains, and why you have to back off and approach the problem differently if you're going to succeed. Um, so when we talk about this stack, we talk about a blockchain layer where we use decentralized identifiers. We talk about peer connections and encrypted messages. We talk about verifiable credentials, and we talk about all the rules you need to build and manage in order to make verifiable credentials work. And we're going to try to deconstruct this the, not from the blockchain out, but from the edges in. Right? Um, if you have questions, if you want to stop me, if you want to ask for a clarification, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll try to repeat your questions so we can keep things going. Um, the room's a little bit full for us to stop for every question, um, but we want to keep people engaged and help make sure that this is going the way we expect it to work. So what is blockchain identity? Right? First off, what is identity? Um, identity means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. In fact, that is, in part, the definition of identity. What context you're operating in defines how you're going to operate in that context. It defines how that relationship's going to go, what data you're going to share, what data you're not going to share, what transactions you're going to engage in and how, right? But we're interested in a more important question of what is decentralized identity. 
We talk a lot about decentralized systems in the blockchain world, but what we mean when we mean decentralized identity is fundamentally different than what we mean when we talk about a smart contract based system. A smart contract based system is built to be the system of record, the only source of truth that everyone must collaborate on in order to affect change of state. Right? You define everything that needs to happen, and when you submit a transaction, you're saying, is this one of the state chains we will allow? If it is, it goes through. If it won't, you may not do that. Right? Then we say we've made a decentralized system because we break all the capabilities down into cryptographic keys. We know only the person who possesses the cryptographic key is able to affect state in the way that we've defined. Right? Hurrah, we're decentralized. Anyone can affect the state that they have rights to and nothing else. Unfortunately, this means that all the information has to be on the blockchain. Right? Any state that you want to change has to be enforced by your smart contracts. So does that mean you can believe something different? Does that mean you can say something different than what he says? That means that you can enforce something differently than someone else enforces it? Well, sort of, because you can have your own namespace and you can do your own smart contracts, but then you've essentially forked the semantics of the system while still having to pile everything into the blockchain. Right? So when we're talking about decentralizing identity, what we're saying is you need to have your own context. It needs to be uniquely yours, and no one else can know about it. Because if you tell them about the context that exists, you've disclosed that identity. Right? I want to have as many different contextual identities as I need to operate, and I don't want everyone else to know about all of them. I want to be able to maintain the information sharing within the relationship that I'm trying to engage in. And when I want to share that information, I want to use the way we sign data in that relationship to prove something to someone else. Right? We want to maintain the decentralization of those identity contexts. We want to be able to say what we need to say in a relationship without having it chase us through the rest of the system and causing correlation that we don't intend. Right? So here we have Alice. Alice wants to sign stuff. Does anyone have a pencil and paper? Can you give me an AES signature for something? Right? How do we sign things? How do we do cryptography? And I have, I've yet to meet somebody who's just done it in their head. If you want to work on that on pencil and paper and then show it to me afterwards, I will be very impressed. Um, but we use devices to represent us. Here's where we get to our first set of standards that we need to talk about. How do we generate cryptographic keys? How do we know they were generated properly? How do we know that they're still secure? How do we manage them staying secure over time? Right? There's a whole series of cryptographic standards that have been in development for quite some time, and we actually have a pretty good idea of the shape of them. We know that cryptography doesn't last forever. This is one of the reasons why identity is different from a decentralization standpoint than most blockchains that are doing smart contracts. Because you're not trying to be the system of record. You don't want everything published on the blockchain because you know and you expect it won't last forever. Right? Disclosing the data that you processed in public is different than disclosing the context that you want to stay private. Right? The consequences of that are different. So it's important you think about the decentralization problem a little bit differently. But we need to build on good cryptographic standards. And that's part of why the identity community is, is really strongly behind Hyperledger Ursa. Because if we have a shared cryptography library that's being used by a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons, it crosses more than one context, then it's more likely that the bugs will get fixed. It's more likely that people will notice the problems. And hopefully, the people who are using URSA for different reasons than the identity community is using URSA will find those problems before we do. Now, maybe it means that we'll find some of the problems before they do. And hopefully, we can fix them when that happens. But um, now that we've said that we've got cryptographic keys, right? I'm going to use a cryptographic key for my identity. Um, this is where most people think, oh, blockchain identity, great. We'll substitute usernames and passwords. And now we'll use the devices. We'll just do cryptographic keys like Bitcoin. I don't have to log in anymore. This is, this is feeling pretty good. Right? And then someone takes and destroys your phone. Um, one of the big takeaways I hope you get today is that if you don't do key management right, blockchain doesn't matter. Ultimately, if you can't get your keys to the edge, to where the clients that want to submit transactions, what you're doing doesn't matter. Because you can't trust whether it means what you think it means. Um, so, we need standards to help you recover your identity. When that phone's destroyed and you get a new phone, how do you reclaim that identity? How do you know that that device works for you and only you? And fundamentally, the way, one of the ways you decide that is can you fire it? Right? If it gets destroyed, can you still reclaim your identity and continue to be you? And even if the software is malicious, can you take away its right to operate on your behalf and can you give that right to a different device? 
From a standardization standpoint, we call this decentralized key management systems. Key management specs have been around for quite some time. We actually have really good enterprise key management specifications, and they're pretty well developed. Businesses have an idea on how to do this. They put business processes in place. They do an excellent job of auditing for it. Well, in some cases, at least those that hire good auditors. Um, but we need this to where it works at a personal level and at the edge, right? This is something that not just enterprise blockchains deal with. This is something that all blockchain solutions deal with. And wallets and key management systems are getting better. And that's one of the things that we try to address in the Hyperledger Aries community is we try to package together all the things that are being built in Ursa to be able to do decentralized key management in a way that you can cobble together to make your systems work, right? Aries doesn't provide the UX to do decentralized key management, but hopefully we provide the infrastructure for you to do that key management. And different products and solutions in the space um, package that together differently to try to provide the best user experience they can and hopefully compete on that basis in order to make the best solution. But key management is not something you do alone. The whole reason you have a cryptographic key is so that you can do something or interact with someone else, right? In some cases, you have that cryptographic key to make it so they can't see your data, right? I'm going to encrypt this data to put it rest so that no one else can see it and no one else can crack it open. Or I'm trying to hide the data from observers. I don't want them to be able to see and understand the data. Right? Or I'm trying to sign data and encrypt data so only the partner, partner or the party that I'm communicating with can see and understand the data. Um, but to make those types of systems work, you have to do key infrastructure. You have to do something to communicate which keys are we going to use and for what. Right? Remember, we, we started talking about decentralized identity. You have different identity contexts. You aren't one thing to everyone. Right? When you're operating with your employer, that's one context. When you're do, acting as the volunteer soccer coach back home, that's a different context. And you don't necessarily want all of those things to be correlated together, right? How you vote isn't your employer's business. At least in the US, we typically think that. Um, but there's a problem. If I just send you my key and you send me your key, how do I know that I actually got your key, right? Classically, we call this the introduction problem. The problem is you get a man in the middle. I thought I was going to give an introduction to Corin, and instead of getting an introduction to Corin, Ryan got in the way, and I introduced myself to Ryan by mistake, and Ryan's pretending to be Corin, right? In PGP, we tried to solve this problem with key servers, right? As long as I can figure out something about um, the person I'm trying to talk to from some public oracle, I can have some idea whether there's a man in the middle or not, right? The trouble is, Key management in a decentralized system is nobody's business but yours, which means it's all your problem and you have to solve it. it turns out solving that problem is messy, right? And when you change your key, you end up building this digital wake of all these kind of keys that you've, you've shed off over time. And when someone looks to find which key is the real you, they're not sure which one they should use. They don't necessarily have a system of record that tells them which one's the most up to date and which one works the best. Uh, a certificate authority style system, what we did is we said, well, let's just say that that guy's the one to ask. And if you ask him, he'll tell you which one's the right one. And don't believe anything else other than what he says, right? I, I, I see everyone going, oh, I see the blockchain already, right? Because I can, instead of using a certificate system, I can use a blockchain for that, right? I can decide which key is the most authoritative key. Um, but that um, introduces an interesting new problem. So let's say we have this uh, system that's going to authenticate my connection, right? So this shadow system is going to do something to let me know whether I'm talking to the real Corin, right? I would like some sort of credential, some signed piece of data from the authority that I can use to present some proof across the wire so that no one else can spoof it, right? I want Corin to give me a proof that says I'm talking to the real Corin such that only Corin could produce that proof and no one else could produce that proof. Right? Or likewise, the other approach is, notice we have the dashed line here. I could go back to the authority and I could say, hey, authority, is this the real Corin? And then he would tell me if it was the real Corin or not. Right? There's some important differences in those two systems right? in terms of what correlation exists and who gets to know what when. Um, and we'll talk about that as we get into the idea of a verifiable credential. Um, but effectively, the idea we're talking about here is once I can do an introduction, we can send encrypted messages back and forth. And if I can use some oracle to authenticate that connection, 
it actually doesn't matter how this connection works. It can go through multiple hops. I can route it through multiple servers. I can do all kinds of things with that connection, right? Because I know that I've encrypted it for its endpoint, and no one except for the endpoint can decrypt it. This points out some, some interesting things. We have three pieces that typically make up uh, some signed cryptographic information. This is oversimplified. You'll want to wait till I finish the slide transitions before I take, to take a picture, because I'm going to talk about them one at a time. The first two pieces are keys and identifiers. Now, if you think about this as a certificate authority, usually you ignore that identifier piece, right? Because identifiers are incidental to the protocol. I put a GUID in the certificate when I issue the certificate because I say, tell me what your key material is. You give me your public key. I will bind it to the attributes, and I'll put the identifiers in so that you can check the revocation list to see if it's revoked or not revoked, right? This doesn't work in a decentralized system because those unique identifiers disclose who is the holder of the credential, right? And let's say we have more than one verifier, right? I'm going to prove something to Vipin, and I'm going to prove it also to Corin. Well, Corin and Vipin could get together and decide whether they'd both talked to me and whether it's the same me. And now they can share information between each other, and I have no idea that they did it. Right? I'm no longer in charge of my information disclosure because they can collude without my participation. Now, let's say I said, here, Vipin, here's my home address and my name and my phone number, and I gave the same information to Corin. Well, of course they can collude then, but I'm the one that decided to do that disclosure. Right? We want a system where the protocol never betrays you. And so in order to make it so that I can manage my cryptographic keys independently of any certificate authority, independently of anyone who's issuing a credential, I want a layer of abstraction on my cryptographic keys so that things that are issued to me are independent of my key rotation and independent of my key management. And that's where the decentralized identifier specification comes in. The idea is we've added a layer of abstraction on key management that lets me say, if I have a particular identifier, I can look it up, just like you would off of a PGP key server or like you would look up a key in a certificate authority system. And I can get information that I need in order to know, are you the owner of this? And if I don't have a way of talking to the owner of this, can I find how to talk to the owner of that? The second piece we talked about a little bit is this idea of a certificate. When I bind keys to the, a particular set of attributes, that's when I'm making a credential. Right? That's when I'm saying, here, you are my employee. This is an employment credential. You are my customer at a bank. Here's your banking credential. Right? You're packaging up a set of attributes, and you're giving them to someone. And to do that, it's not enough just to sign the attributes that you're handing to someone. You need to know why. The, what intention did you have of signing this thing and giving it to them? You need some set of semantics or some set of identifiers that describe all those attributes so you know what use cases you can trust them for and what use cases you can't trust them for. Now, note I didn't say what use cases the issuer wants you to trust them for. I said what use cases that you want to trust them for. Right? Because in order to make this kind of information sharing system work, each person in the system has a unique role. Everyone's in charge of their own key management. It's their own problem, and they want to be able to do that independently. Everybody wants to be able to publish data for other people to verify, but they don't want you to track or trace or understand that data based on the private relationships, only to be able to understand it based on the public attestation that you made. Right? And so this abstraction shows up in a bunch of different places and in a bunch of different ways. And it's one of the reasons why a decentralized identity system is different than just a decentralized blockchain. So let's look a little bit at DIDs. So here I have a DID that is the sovereign method DID. So this is a URL. It's, it's, it's a DID, um, which is essentially a declaration that if you use this URL and you resolve it through what's called a DID resolver, you're going to get back something we call a DID doc. A full name is a DID document. But this is a data model specification at the W3C. The, the 1.0 of this data model specification has been published as a recommendation. You use that, plug it into a DID resolver, you'll get back a DID document that says, here are the keys that are the owners of this DID. If you want to know whether this object is from the owner of the DID, you can check to see if it was signed by one of these public keys. 
It also establishes some other semantics about how the did works. There's a bunch of different attributes you can look up and you can look at and how that works. But the idea here is now if I have a did, I can say, yes, I know that this is Scott because he told me this is his did and I can tell that the stuff that was sent to me was signed by that did. And if Scott rotates his keys, then I just look up that did document again and I see the changes that have been made and I can follow along. And there's a lot of ways of doing that type of an oracle, right? I could just gossip it to the relationships that I have and keep it very private. Um, if you haven't talked to Daniel Hardman, he has some really great sessions that are going to be going on later that talk about the peer did specification and how you can decentralize protocols off chain. Um, or it can be a centralized system. If you have signal on your phone, they centralize this identifier system by using your phone number on a server that's encrypted with SGX to make it so that the lookups can only happen in their centralized architecture. But you could easily think of it as did signal and then your phone number, right? That could be something you could define as a did method spec. Anything that uses a cryptographic key to bootstrap a messaging protocol could be modeled as a did. Dids have an interesting property that's not the same thing as a UUID and that's not the same thing as an ORN in that they imply this construct of ownership, meaning someone owns and controls the cryptographic keys behind them. Right? You can abuse dids and you can throw them on everything like you would UUIDs, but when you do that, you lose a lot of the value of what a did is about. Because dids are about knowing who's the owner and can I trust that this came from the, the source and can they own and manage their cryptographic key over time in a way that I can continue to use the data even though the keys rotated and changed. So let's have some fun with signing encryption. We've got Alice and Bob, they've got a connection and they're going to start sending things around. But you know, Alice and Bob have cell phones in this model and I don't know about you, but cell phones, they tend to move around. My battery goes dead all the time. And you can't rely on them always being online. You can't rely on them always being connected. You can't rely on them always being connected in the same place. So you need to be able to have a messaging system that allows routing through multiple hops. Some of those hops may be malicious. They may not be owned or controlled directly by the individual. All right, remember, we established at the beginning that you need to have cryptographic keys and you need to be able to fire the device that owns and controls those keys. Right, because you don't want to talk to Alice's OS provider. You want to talk to Alice, right? You don't want, you know, the, the, the phone vendor to impersonate Alice. You don't want the cloud operator to impersonate Alice. You want to talk to Alice, right? So when we message, we expect that it goes through multiple hops, and we expect that those hops might not be owned or controlled by a party. So we have a, a, a specification that's built on top of the did specification. We like to call it did communications. Or for short, we call it DIDCOMS. DIDCOMS um, was incubated in, in Hyperledger Indy that split off into the Hyperledger Ares project. And the spec specification work that's a part of uh, Hyperledger Ares has moved into the Decentralized Identity Foundation under the, the working group called the DIDCOM Working Group. And this envelope message specification lets you say things like, Alice says hi. So she tells her cloud agent, I want to say hi to Bob. Alice's agent sends an encrypted, messages, an encrypted message to Bob that says hi. But the, Bob's cloud agent may not be able to decrypt it at all. All it can say is, oh, this routes to the edge over here. Bob's agent picks it up when it calls in. Or if it has a connection, maybe the cloud agent forwards it straight on to Bob's phone. And Bob's phone gets a pop-up that says, oh, hi, from Alice. Right? Because we've handled an introduction protocol specification inside of Ares, and because we have the, the the DIDCOM specification for building all of these different fundamental message types, you can now do what we call basic message. And you can send all sorts of just little encrypted payloads of whatever text or binary that you'd like. And that can be used to build all sorts of different kinds of things, right? So we talked about messaging, but one of the things we didn't talk a lot about, remember, is this oracle, right? This, this shadowy figure here. Identity systems typically work like this. If you're a developer, you've probably built one of these on accident, um, where you stumbled into a situation where you needed to save data about your user, and you said, oh, where am I going to put this? Oh, now we need a username and password. Now we need some login. Or we need some system of making sure we have the same person we had last time. I know we'll give them a password, we'll give them some secret that they can then present back to us, or maybe a cookie, and we'll make it so that we can store a bunch of data about them that we can trust and we can clean up and we can use in a uniform way because otherwise my software is broken and I have to fix bugs all night. Right? 
And this is what has, in large part, led to a lot of centralized monopolies on the internet. Right? Because instead of you having and holding and controlling your data, it all ends up on the server. You don't even know it's there in many cases. You certainly don't have any ability to change it unless the developer who's running that server gave you permission to do so. It turns out that most blockchain identity systems, that's exactly what they do. And then the company will come and tell you they're selling you a decentralized identity system because it's on a blockchain. Throw them out of your office. Because this is what happens. All the data comes off the blockchain. It's all from the same place. If you get the keys to the data, you get the keys to the kingdom. Everything's there. There's no isolation of context. If there are isolations of context, you have to consider them different versions of Alice. Because they're effectively different, totally separate accounts that don't interact. It makes it really difficult to collectively prove anything. Because anything you did to isolate one individual from another meant that you had to treat them as completely separate individuals, which makes it difficult to transact and operate across contexts because I can't take the value out of the account I have with Vipin and use it in the, in the, in the account that I have with Corin. right? Because Corin and Vipin have no idea about each other. And if I try to tell Corin about Vipin, he says, I, I don't know him. right? I need something more. OK, we've got the solution. It's called federated identity, this time for sure. right? The federated identity system, this is what we end up with. It all still comes off the same system of record. It's called your IDP. And you know, we were really excited about federated identity. It was going to solve this problem. If you look at SAML and OAuth, they actually have provisions for you to act as your own independent identity provider. Like you would stand up your own server in your basement and you'd act as your own IDP. But in practice, none of the developers really support it. Because then you get into your, your website and you say, log in with anything. And not only do you not remember your username and password, you don't remember which IDP you used to create the username and password. Right? And so in practice, what happened is everyone consolidated down to a very, very few number of IDPs. Right? You use Facebook, you use GitHub, you use Microsoft, which is now the same thing as GitHub. And, you know, and those IDPs end up consolidating into a natural monopoly simply for ease of use and, ease and convenience of how it works. So even though we've, we've color coded all these attributes based on which server they came from, in practice, you ended up exactly back into the same model that you had before. There are even more blockchain identity folks who think that this is a decentralized identity system. You need something else. You need multi-sourced identity. I need to be able to create a connection with Vipin. He needs to be able to sign data for me to hold. I create a different connection with Corin. He signs data for me to hold. And then I'm going to take those credentials from both sources and I'm going to prove the things they gave me as credentials to Scott. And he knows, based on the public attestations, that those credentials are valid, not tampered with, and not revoked. And he knows that in aggregate, right? Because I'm not using a secret to authenticate with Scott. I'm using a connection. I have cryptographic keys to know that he's the real him. He also has cryptographic keys to know that I'm the real me, right? And because we've done that at each connection, we can now do this information tr sharing transitively across multiple hops. So I can get a credential. I can show a credential. But I don't have to do it with one peer. I can now do it with any peer. Right? And that's what makes the system decentralized, is that I, anyone can say anything they want. And anyone can prove anything they want to to anyone else. Right? And I hope. There's two things that you just thought about when I said that. Two things that hopefully made you panic just a little bit in your heart. One is, I don't just have a cryptographic key for me. I have a cryptographic key per context I operate in. Right? Cryptographic key management isn't just a little bit important. It's a lot important. And second is, how on earth am I going to know who should say what? Right? Because just because you get a, a, a license that says, this person is allowed to, to do brain surgery, doesn't mean you should trust it, right? In the real world, we do a lot of things to figure out whether that's the case or not. In a cryptographic system like this, you also have to do all those same kinds of things, right? So we talked a little bit about the decentralized identifier specification, right? Vipin gave me a credential, but in order for Scott to know it's the real Vipin, Vipin needs to have some public DID that says, I'm going to be issuing the following kind of credential, right? Maybe a membership credential in the identity working group. Hopefully, you know all about the identity working group and you're, you're doing some things to help participate there. You need to have some decentralized key management stuff, right? You need to know that these cryptographic keys are me, 
and that I haven't lost them or given them away to someone else. Right? If you can't count on the continuity of those identifiers in the DIDs, you can't count on the reliability of the system. Right? We need to be able to authenticate using those cryptographic keys. Right? I need to, to be able to authenticate back and forth. And we need to be able to exchange signed payloads of information. So we're going to go a little bit quickly here. So then we end up in a system where everybody can issue their own packets of information independently of one another. And this is part of what balances the market from what we saw in any of the other centralized identity systems. Because if one party, say your school, doesn't want to cooperate, you can source similar data from other organizations. Right? This is what we do in the real world all the time. When you go to get a voter registration, you have present this or three of the following of these or two of the following of these. Right? When one part of the identity system doesn't work, we usually fall back to other pieces of the identity system. When you get locked out of your car in the grocery store parking lot, they are not relying on your key in your pocket to authenticate you as the owner of the car. They rely on a different issuer in order to know that you are the real owner of the car. So the issuer is in charge of what they're willing to sign, and they get to say something about what that data means. The holder is in charge of what data they're willing to retain and who they're willing to share that information with. The verifier is in charge of what data they're willing to rely upon and what data they're for, for what use case or for what purpose. And those roles have to stay separate for the stability of the system to be preserved. The verifier has a trust relationship with the issuer, but the verifier doesn't talk to the issuer. If the verifier starts to do real-time API signaling back to the issuer and talks to them, then what happens is whoever has more market power between the issuer and the verifier becomes the system of record, consolidates the data, and stops giving the data to the holder. That's not a theoretical proposition. That is exactly what happened in OAuth and in OpenID Connect. So we want to maintain the three-party system of how the information is shared so that you retain the ability to own and control your data and maintain it over time. This doesn't mean that you have to have your own wallet on your own infrastructure. Because there are certainly lots of issuers or verifiers who have motivation to, to manage that type of infrastructure at scale. But they have to manage it in a way that you own and control it and you can fire it. Because if it doesn't work for you, you can't count on the continuity of the IDs and you can't count on the authority of the key management system. So we have protocols to issue credentials. I need to be able to send messages back and forth to make the credential system work and to make sure that I, you're, I'm giving you the data that's fit for purpose for what you're trying to do with it because I'm not in charge of where you present it. I'm just in charge of giving it to you. And this is great for me because I can use this to make it so the data that I've cleaned and managed for my brand can be used for you to pay me for things that I can't anticipate. Right? You can create credentials that require payment and make it so that there's a lot more people who are willing to pay you. Right? So we expect that this giving someone a credential is a negotiation. This allows us to sign the credential in a way that can be presented to multiple parties, but it also means that you get a marketplace for how a credential is issued and you get the schemas that are the most useful. We also have a mechanism for presenting proofs. I have a diagram of this that looks exactly like the previous slide where you offer someone a proof and then they request a proof and then you provide the proof to them. It really is as simple as that, but when you start writing a spec down, this is what you get. Because um, you have to account for all the corner cases. So uh, if you go into Aries, this is actually an Aries RSC on how proofs are presented. And this is the diagram out of that, that, out of that deck. Um, if you run into St Stephen Curran and the guys from BCGov who are here at the conference, tell them thank you for all the good work they've done on this specification. Um, there are a lot of community members here that have spent a lot of treasure, blood, and tears making all this stuff work. Um, and we're starting to see a situation where you can just sit down in front of a T-board and you can get to where you can exchange credentials in an afternoon. So I'm hoping that some of you come and visit us at the, the workshops. BCGov is running a workshop on the Ares Cloud Agent Python on Thursday. And the Sovereign Foundation is running a workshop on building out use cases and using kind of the breadth of all the open source code bases where we'll be walking you through how to make this protocol work and set up a POC for yourself. Um, so when we get back to the layers, remember we have the idea of an oracle. The Sovereign Foundation's Oracle is built to run in a public way, in a public place. Right? So anyone can verify credentials that were issued against this definition. You never put the credential on the chain. The only thing you put on the chain is, I'm going to sign stuff. 
this is what the stuff I'm going to sign is going to look like, and here's how to tell if it's revoked or not. I'm not going to use any unique identifiers in that proof. I'm going to use techniques that don't disclose who it is. So I'm going to do a set membership proof to say if you're revoked or not revoked without disclosing which one you are. But I'm just going to put the definitions here. So we talk about it. It's not the source of truth. It's the root of trust. Right? You're going to walk a chain of trust based on the domain-specific credentials you want, but you can check whether they're revoked or not based on what's here. And that way I can have a medical license credential, I can have a banking credential, I can have a government ID credential, and I can prove them all in aggregate. I can know that they're revoked or not revoked in an atomic way, because I can check them all at one single point in time on the chain, but I don't have to talk to any of those issuers. I can gather all that data and selectively prove the pieces. I have the layer that gives us connections, right? We talked about we've done an introduction protocol, we've traded keys, now we've routed messages all over the place. That's the cryptographic trust basis of the system. And then once we have that cryptographic trust, we need people to exchange credentials with. We need to know what the purpose of those credentials are, and we need to know whether the issuers of those credentials are following rules that make them fit for purpose for us. Right? A certificate authority follows a pretty extensive set of rules to know whether or not that you should trust that certificate. And it's similar in lots of different domains. Your driver's license authority follows a set of rules of who they'll issue a driver's license to and who they will not. How do they double spend proof a driver's license so that they don't issue two driver's licenses to two people for VIPN instead of just the one VIPN that we all know? Right? Those are the rules layer of the system. And the sovereign network has infrastructure to support all of these different layers in order to make this credential ecosystem work. It's not the identity system. It's what we would call the identity meta system. It sits underneath the identity system. And one of the things that's interesting about this is Hyperledger Ursa has cryptography to do multi-signature credentials with threshold signatures. So an issuer doesn't have to be a single party. An issuer can actually be an entire blockchain. You don't have to build your identity infrastructure on your own. If you leverage these specifications, your Genesis transaction block effectively works like what we would call a credential definition. You can say, my blockchain state is backed by the following signatures. And if we can collectively sign it on our blockchain, anyone can validate or trust it based off anchoring these types of objects. So these specs work not just to build the sovereign network, but this pattern is a recursive pattern. As long as we have a quorum of folks who are willing to be the notary or our public oracle, we can repeat this pattern at every level we want to in any place that we need to. So the Sovereign Foundation runs a public network to do this. We also support and do what we call the network of networks um, at the Sovereign Foundation where we can help you stand up your own identity network for your own purpose-built thing. Um, and all the code and all the specs that we're working on are all open source. We do it all as Apache 2 like we do at Hyperledger. Um, we host most of the code here at Hyperledger. Some of it's at the Decentralized Identity Foundation, also under the same Apache 2 licenses. And we work on this, the open specifications at standards organizations that are publishing those specs for everybody to see and use. Because part of what makes this work is that you need to know you can take your ball and go home. Remember we talked about when your device doesn't work for you, you need to be able to fire it and hire a new device? That's also true of the Oracle layer. And so to make the system work, you have to be aggressively open at every part of the system. Otherwise, you can't trust that you own and control it. Someone else could then say, oh, we're going to take those identifiers over and we're going to become you. And you have to make sure the system's architected so that that cannot happen. And remember we talked about messaging and you can send any payload you want? We spend a lot of time talking about verifiable credentials, but that's just scratching the surface. If you've been following along in the Aries community, all sorts of other interesting protocols are starting to emerge. We now have decorators for payments that can use any sort of cryptographic asset as a payment as part of the messaging infrastructure. We now have pieces that do basic messaging, so you can do all sorts of different messaging payloads. And that's starting to be built out into a, a feature discovery protocol, so I can say, hey, Scott, what topics do you want to talk about? And he can list those out, and my agent can say, oh, yeah, I know how to talk about those four. I'll go ahead and, and start engaging in those protocols. And the neat thing about having a root of trust is that those protocols can also be signed, right? And so you can do recursively all the sorts of things we've always wanted to do with package management, with software discovery and software management, where you can walk the chain of trust to build out all kinds of cryptographic systems because you have a core of key management that you can build on top of. We can talk about schemas. We can talk about the new rich schemas. We can talk about how the sovereign network works. We can talk about the software stack that exists in Hyperledger and a few things on top. Um, but remember, standards are always an interesting thing 
Because as soon as you start building a standard, someone is going to ask for another standard. So if you want to participate in this work, please come and help us. There's a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of places to have fun. Uh, in particular, I recommend showing up on the identity working group calls if you're not a tech person. You'll get to hear a lot about the business cases and about the diversity of how identity systems work across all the blockchain ecosystem. And if you're a coder or if you want to get deeper into the tech, show up on the identity working group implementers call where we'll tell you the summary of what's going on in all of these communities and we'll help you get involved. So thank you. And if you have questions, please uh, feel free to grab me in the hall afterwards or like I said, I promised if you're involved in the sovereign governance framework or you're a code contributor on one of the code bases I described, would you raise your hand? Phil should raise his hand. You can attack these people when the discussion's done. Thanks, everybody.